Okay, so um, hello everyone, and yeah, thanks for joining uh, us so uh, early in the morning. Uh, we'll try to make this uh, fun and entertaining. And I'm Gaby Mejias. I work at DataSite as a community and program manager. And for those of us who are, uh, for those of you who are new to DataSite, uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We were created in 2009 um, by and for the research community. Uh, our vision is to connect research and to identify knowledge, and we do so uh, by enabling uh, DOI and metadata registration. And uh, this is us at the CSV Conf, uh, Mary, my colleague Arturo, and myself. And uh, organizations join DataSite as institutional members um, to uh, connect the repositories and start registering uh, DOIs and identifying the research data, but also other resources and outputs. And currently, we have more than 280 members across 50 countries. Uh, overall, these members um, or included in these 280 members, we have 56 consortia, so overall we have more than 1,000 uh, research institutions that have connected the repositories, and so far we have uh, 41 million DOIs in our registry. And we have, or we identify a wide range of research um, resources and uh, outputs. Um, data sets are the most common uh, resource type in our registry, uh, but we also um, identify uh, collections, software, images, preprints, uh, models, uh, workflows, and we also uh, specialize in great, a uh, great well, great and great literature, uh, like thesis, dissertations, report, technical standards, and more. And now I'm going to hand over to Mary. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, I hope you're going to enjoy this slightly tenuous metaphor. This is a story of polyamory or polyamor in Spanish. <coughs> so. Um, the story begins uh, with DOIs and metadata. Uh, they are a match made in heaven. Uh, on the left, we see a DOI. And uh, on the right, as you're looking at the screen, is some data site metadata. Uh, this is the creator property from the data site metadata schema. Um, so, a DOI is, uh, well, DOI stands for Digital Object Identifier, and it's a type of persistent identifier. Um, persistent identifiers are long-lasting identifiers that are assigned to a specific entity. So, um, here we see a DOI, which is a special resolvable URL. And these uh, are registered in the global handle server and they always point to the same resource. So there we see an example of a repository landing page from uh, Dryad. And um, the DOI infrastructure is managed by the DOI Foundation. Uh, they are a, a different organization, but they're also a non-profit non -for -profit organization, um, and so they manage this open, community-owned infrastructure, and this builds trust. Uh, metadata, maybe some of you not so familiar with it, is a specific set of information designed to provide a description of a resource. Uh, metadata is essential so that research outputs can be discovered and reused. And data site, the met data site metadata scheme is developed by the Metadata Working Group, who are an amazing group of volunteers. And all of the data site metadata is openly available with a CC0 license. So it can be harvested via one of our APIs by anyone. Metadata um, describes things. So some of the examples from data sites, metadata schema, 
uh, of uh, description properties would be subject, rights, and description. And uh, metadata uh, also wants to connect with other PIDs. And here is where we see the polyamorous <laughs> relationship. Um, so in the middle here, you see the research output, which has a DOI assigned to it. And through the different um, properties of the data site metadata schema, uh, this research output can be connected to many other things. So for example, we have a uh, funding reference field which connects to raw identifiers, affiliation identifier also connecting to raw IDs, researchers uh, with their ORCID IDs and uh, other related resources through the related identifiers property. For example, other DOIs would be the uh, obvious choice. So DOIs and metadata uh, form a consensual open relationship <laughs> and uh, this is the contributor field from or property from the data type metadata schema in XML and what you're seeing here is um, the information about the contributor, in this case is the project leader, um, that's a controlled vocabulary field and uh, we see here in the scheme URI uh, sorry, the name identifier field, the ORCID ID of that person. Uh, and also to uh, mention, very importantly, is the uh, subject classification. Um, we use the fields of science and technology as a standard uh, classification, but you can enter any subject scheme there. So uh, together, DOIs, uh, metadata, and other PIDs make research data fair um, through this persistent open infrastructure, which includes interoperable links um, and metadata that can be cited and reused and reproduced. Um, yeah, so they are really a fundamental part of the FAIR principles. And this generates credit for researchers who share research outputs. Um, citations, we're all familiar with uh, citations between publications, so researchers citing other publications in their uh, articles. Um, we want to make it the norm to cite research data in research articles as well. And we recently launch, launched the global uh, data citation corpus, which will really um, increase the number of data citations um, that we're able to um, expose. And so uh, DOIs, metadata, and other PIDs are all part of a big and loving uh, community, uh, which includes um, raw, crossref, or kids as other persistent identifier organizations, as well as organizations like NISO, RDA, Force 11, and of course, CSV Conf. <laughs> and uh, very important to mention that uh, persistent identifiers and their metadata are the building blocks of research infrastructure. And uh, to extend the metaphor, we can say that the same way polyamory is changing the status quo in relationships, open infrastructure drives uh, change in research culture, um, increasing uh, transparent, uh, uh, transparency and uh, recognition in scholarship, which can also lead to more incentives and hopefully also more rewards uh, for open research practices. And the um, connections um, and um, all these um, open relationships we've been discussing between uh, uh, PITS and metadata um, 
form uh, the pit graph, um, which can be queried using the data site GraphQL API and uh, through a user interface uh, called data site commons. And this enables uh, searches by uh, DOIs um, for uh, works, ORCID ID for uh, individuals, and raw identifiers uh, for organizations. And um, you can also search the data site registry. And for example, um, if you enter the word, um, the keyword polyamory, you can retrieve all the works that contain um, polyamory in the metadata. And um, you can also, um, in this case, um, you can see the, the data set and the work that cites um, this uh, data set. In this uh, case, it's a journal article. And um, through the links in the metadata, it's possible to find um, other related entities like um, the creators of the data set um, and obviously uh, their ORCID IDs and see their profiles. And um, we can conclude that open metadata and polyamory have a lot in common. Open uh, persistent identifiers and their metadata lead to more uh, transparency, integrity, trust, communication, and equity in research. Thank you. Thank you so much. We now have time for some questions. So we'll start from the back and work our way up. Um, wondering what sort of user research do you do to identify the metadata that you want to include in your schema? Uh, we have, a, we have a, the metadata working group that I mentioned. Um, they work with our technical community manager and they actually have a, an open feedback process for every uh, iteration of the metadata schema. So um, it's actually um, now um, uh, there's a, um, a, a kind of web page where you can go and a GitHub um, um, like form where you can submit uh, feedback. Um, any, so anyone can go there to, to submit feedback. And then that's kind of curated and um, obviously, yeah, prioritized in terms of what works for each because you know not everything can be included changes are very small but um, yeah we definitely have an open feedback process for that and also to mention that um, the data site metadata schema currently we are on version 4.4 and it's actually a standard used uh, globally by many organizations and every year uh, we launch a call for participation for uh, new members of our metadata working group. Uh, so if anyone's interested, uh, stay tuned in our blog or in our social networks or let us know and we'll share that information with you uh, the next time um, we open the call for participation. Hi. Uh, so I just wanted to know what is the difference between this standard and let's say DCAT? Is there any difference? Because uh, even that like the DCAT is data catalog vocabulary, I think. So used by CCAN and others. So like, what is the difference, or is it the same? Is just another standard? The um, I'm not familiar. Is it DCAT? DCAT. D C A T. It's a type of metadata schema, is it? Correct. Yeah, there are there yeah. are different metadata schemas. Dublin, uh, the data site metadata schema is based on Dublin Core. Um, but it's a standard uh, that's used specifically by Datasite for Datasite DOIs. So any organization that wants to register a DOI, there are six properties that are mandatory. Um, and there are, there's lots of, um, let's say, uh, interoperability between different metadata schemas. So we uh, actually um, allow DOIs can be registered with like schema.org, for example, JSON-LD, and then that's kind of transformed into data site XML. Um, but our standard is in XML format, and it's a specific schema for data site. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, repositories have their own like metadata um, 
but we have to have like a standard that's specifically for uh, data site DOIs. Yeah. And sorry, one, one more question. Uh, with respect to DOIs, so a lot of open data platforms, let's say especially ones developed on top of CCAN, you know, they don't have like out of the box, there is no DOI. Yeah. Even if you pub publish any data on CCAN, you will not get, you will have to get a COI from some other platform which has that service or which provides that service, like Zenodo or so. But essentially, then what you're doing is you're depositing your data at two or three different places, one just to get a DOI. So, and because DOIs are expensive and there's a whole process around it. So, is there like, especially for smaller data platforms, like what is the process to best process to get this DOI at easily? Yeah, I guess the um, I mean, there are generalist repositories like you say, like Zenodo. So if the requirement is for only a small number of DOIs, then that's a good solution. But we do we yeah, clearly it's not good to have uh, the same resource deposited in in different places. Um, and so we have consortium uh, leads in in different places across the world that can help with uh, smaller organizations to get a DOI, um, yeah, because essentially uh, an organization needs to have a data site membership or be part of a consortium in order to register DOIs. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, that's, uh, apart from the generous repository, is there's, there's not really, you need the, the CCAN has a plugin um, that allows you to register DOIs, but yeah, you need credentials. You need to be able to to register those DOIs for your organization. Yeah. And just a comment to your remark that DOIs are expensive. Um, DOIs have a cost. Um, infrastructure has a cost. Uh, it, it takes a lot of investment to develop, run it, maintain it, and innovate it. And uh, again, we're a non-profit organizations, and we're governed by our member organizations. And uh, yeah, we we bought, we uh, operate on a cost recovery uh, model. And the cost of not having your data or your outputs identified and lose visibility and um, do not give credit to your researchers, um, it's more it's higher than uh, data site membership. So just a, a comment on that. All right, let's give Gabby and Mary a round of applause. Thank you so much.